Welcome to episode 17 of Custom Made, and today I'm joined again by Sarah Reed, Vice President of Design Research here at Dialexa. Once you've finished listening to this episode, you can hear more from Sarah on previous episodes of Custom Made, such as episode 8, where we discuss the value of storytelling in product development, and episode 5, where we explore lean design research. Sarah is a product designer whose fascination with how design and psychology interact has led her on a relentless pursuit to shape user experiences that enable elegant solutions to complex problems. Her specialities in web and UX design include layout, interaction, and aesthetic design for websites and software products. Prior to joining Dialexa, Sarah leveraged her love of design thinking to design administration tools for AT&T business-to-business services and game art for GameStop's PC download business. Most notably, Sarah worked for a healthcare industry software provider where she used her UX problem-solving and process improvement skills to streamline online interactions that contained a massive amount of user information, options, decisions, complex rules and restrictions. The only precedent to an application in this industry was paying someone to sort through spreadsheets and faxing the paperwork. Sarah is someone who is concerned with the why of a product, workflow and user experience, and she is a fan of pragmatic research to enable her to provide insights in a fast and smart manner, which is exactly what we're going to be discussing today. Now let's get on with the show. On this week's episode, Sarah and I are discussing why you need to take a pragmatic view to user research so that you understand just enough to move forward with your product development rather than spend too much time on research that slows down your product development process or no research at all that leads to unsuccessful products. Successful products come from understanding the user needs, their pains, and their experiences that the product is trying to deliver against. But research is still seen by many as either an area to cut from the product development process, can lead to analysis paralysis, or would rather move forward on assumptions based on historical data points or opinions. We first encounter research in school with research papers, learning about a topic through systematic investigation into and study of materials and sources in order to establish facts and reach new conclusions, and then writing a report about it. But in the real world, this approach is not always practical, and research needs to take a different, more agile approach if it is to be successfully applied to product development. During this week's episode, we're going to explore the three main types of research to inform your product development, and to find what just enough means. These three types are user research, which focuses on understanding user behaviors, needs, and motivations through observation techniques, task analysis, and other feedback methodologies, Market research, which is the action or activity of gathering information about consumers' needs and preferences. And design research, which was originally constituted as primarily research into the process of design, developing from work and design methods. But the concept has been expanded to include research embedded within the process of design, including work concerned with the context of designing and research-based design practice. And before you say it, don't get me wrong, successful products can be created by following your gut and intuition. The many successes of Steve Jobs are because of this, though the less discussed product failures are also based on gut and intuition. But you don't get a good gut and intuition without being immersed in the world you are designing for. You must know about the people and their behaviours as well as have the vision and strategy to bring about change. You need to build experience and by following the advice Sarah shares in this episode, you'll be on your way to building that experience to have an informed opinion or gut. As a reminder, you can find show notes and links to recommended resources for this and every episode at dialexa.com. And finally, if you haven't already, you can hit subscribe and leave us a rating on Apple Podcasts, iTunes, SoundCloud, and everywhere else you listen to Custom Made. It helps other listeners find us, and I'd love to hear what you think. You can also tweet me at Doug Platts with any feedback, questions, and potential topics. And so without further ado, here is Sarah Reed. Yeah, so I'm currently the VP of Design Research, and one of the reasons that I'm really passionate about research is when we kick off our projects and we start um, wanting to uh, design a product or re-architect a solution, um, we're really concerned with the why we're doing this. Um, oftentimes, when we start on a project, people have ideas and some things they've outlined, um, but it's really important to get into the heart of the matter because you can put Band-Aids on solutions or think it looks like one thing, but then as we uncover and as we build and design, we find out there's this other thing that would have been nice to know at the beginning because we would have changed our solution, having to know, you know, five steps back. It wasn't just solving the problem here. It was solving it upstream or downstream, or this was the real problem that's giving people um, 
heartburn. So I'm really a fan of research because it helps support your whys and gets to the heart of why we're doing something. And that helps build better products faster and smarter. And I'm a fan of pragmatic research because we don't have time to really um, uncover everything and you know do a lot of hours of in-depth understanding and synthesis. Really, when we're talking about building products and building solutions, we want to work fast so we need to really understand the the get the answers we need to the to the questions we're dealing with right now, and then deal with the next set um, as as we go forward and iterate. Perfect. And thank thanks for joining us this week. And for for our listeners, Sarah's previously been on custom made episodes, um, talking about storytelling in episode eight. Uh, and Lean Design Research in Episode 5. So be, be sure to check those out uh, once you finish listening to this episode. And yeah, I think the, the topic of user research is an interesting one. We've covered it in a couple of different ways, in a couple of different lenses on previous episodes as well. But really, it's, it seems to be that area of product development that um, you know everyone understands there's a value in understanding your users, understanding their needs, their pains, looking at how they're um, using the, the product that you want to modernize or you want to build for, um, that scenario, that situation, that experience. But so many times you see it where that's the area, that research where it gets cut or removed entirely from the product development process. Um, and that obviously is, is a risk of, well, how do you know what you're building is the right thing? Um, and how do you make sure that it is going to differentiate your business um, and differentiate that experience so that that user continues to use it. And you know, whilst, whilst I just said that that you can that that seems to be an area where it gets cut, there is also times where it can go to the other end of that spectrum where you end up in um, analysis paralysis, where you're just digging into so much data, trying to trying to capture every single piece of information that the process takes too long. Mm -hmm. And may, maybe that's where people get frustrated with, with research in some ways as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and then there's the, the other example and scenario where, where we don't need the research because we've already got the data points or we already know our user from research we did three, five years ago that was more very general, not specific about it. And so I think it's really important that we, we dig into mm -hmm. what is just enough research to move forward with your decision points or to validate the, the decisions that you're going to make. Mm -hmm. And so, Sarah, um, let's, let's kind of start to dig into this. Um, you know, in your experience, you know, how, how are you... How would you define research in, in the first place? Um, how would you really start to think about um, when, you're, when you're looking for defining what it is you need to build um, or what it is that you need to solve for, um, what is the type of research that you would um, expect to dig into? Yeah, and I think that's a good question because when we first think or encounter research, right, we re it's really in school when we're talking about writing research papers, and it's usually in a, in a situation where we're trying to understand a topic, read up a lot about it, and then write a paper that might synthesize those ideas, or maybe it's just spitting out those ideas again and saying it in a different way. Um, but when it comes to really understanding something, research is involved in really understanding a topic and coming up with new conclusions or patterns based on that. Now, when we talk about user research and design research and market research, these are all types, different types and flavors of research that we use in building products, and they inform us in different ways. With user research, um, we're really focused on understanding user behaviors and needs and motivations, and usually it's around you know, product development and how they're using it and what... Uh, that process is like for them. With market research, it's really understanding consumer behaviors and gathering that information about um, what their needs and preferences are and how um, much data we're having in the reports and kind of gives us more of trends of people's behaviors. And then there's design research, which sometimes I do end up blurring with user research, where design research is really utilizing um, research methods in a way to help improve their designs and help really um, get to a better 
practice of why they're doing something and how their designs are informed in the decisions they're, they're being, that they're making in the design process. And that can be service design. That doesn't necessarily have to be product design. With user research, I usually narrow it for, further into product design, um, and, and that's some of the differences there. And I, and I think that's, that, that's an important distinction between the academic research that we're so used to that there needs to be a thoroughness, and then there's a big document at the end that, that explains everything and the rationale and all the different bits, whereas once you get into product development and the research that's required can be more nimble and can be more focused so that it just keeps you moving forward to get that product live because the, the research will only get you so far mm -hmm. once the product is live and you want it obviously based on certain data points to build a successful product to go live, you're going to expect to continue to iterate on that going forward as well. Um, and so let's let's kind of dig into the the three types of research that you talked about: user design, user research, design research, and market research. And so let's let's start with user research. You know, what what are some of the um, techniques or tactics that you, you would kind of pull from your toolkit? Because obviously there's a there's a vast array that you could use. Yeah. And so how do you kind of what do you think about when you start to say, okay, here's a particular project or problem that you're trying mm -hmm. to solve. Um, this is what I'm going to start to pull from to start to feed into the next piece of research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with user research, the first thing that comes to mind when I talk about it really is that user testing and interviews, that qualitative information I can get by sitting with somebody and um, having them go through an interaction of a product or try to accomplish a task and really observe what they're thinking and how they're interacting with it. Um, but there are other methods outside of just utilizing a prototype and sitting down with people. Because you may not um, be at a prototype phase yet. Yes, yeah. yeah. And so there's, I mean, I can go on about uh, several different methods um, that you can use. I think I even have a handbook that's like the 40 different, you know, usability tests where you can do card sorting to help with um, structure of your website or you can do mood boards and have people journal and do a couple different things to really understand their feelings and what they're saying, as well as how do they understand the site and how do they understand the, the um, architecture to, is the, what you've designed usable? Mm -hmm. So there's big picture, little picture, um, granular level things you can use in your toolkit when it comes to user research that's geared towards understanding the product and how people would utilize it in what context, whether it's in um, a grocery store and you're trying to understand the grocery store space or if it's in um, just particularly their mobile app and how they utilize that. Um, and so where, where would you feel like you'd get more value? Would it be more ob observing your target users or is it interviewing your target users? You know, it, do, you, do you only get so much from an interview and you've really got to kind of spend time? It depends on the, where you are in your process of understanding um, the product, and that depends on, to me, eth ethnographic and, and big picture type where you're just observing and trying to find how people are utilizing that. Oftentimes is helpful when you're trying to um, uncover or start new and start fresh and see what problems arise or what um, data points are out there so that you can gather this big picture idea of what are they doing, what are their behaviors, and what problems are they having so that I can start tailoring a solution to solve actual problems and add actual value based on what I'm seeing. Um, when it comes to like interviews in a, in a lab, that is helpful with that interaction, but also helpful in, in validating, once again, maybe some bigger picture ideas. Like we think these features are important and we've mocked up these kind of areas of these screens that we think is valuable. Do people understand it? I can ask questions about, do they find those things valuable? What would they expect to see? I can get kind of a um, framework of a conversation of, what are their expectations and current behaviors and how I can tie it to an actual product that we're kind of thinking about and, and have ideas with. Um, but I think there's value in tying that qualitative, having those stories and those quotes from people so that you can tie the human element to why you're doing something. But there's also value in having data sets where you might be um, putting on your user testing, but you might be doing it on something like a usability hub where you can get 25, 50, several people utilizing it, and then you've got some data to support um, 
your, you know, some numbers, not just the stories of how people are using it, but you actually know out of this many, they're being able to successfully complete this. And so you've got some statistics. And that's like the nice balance between using something like market research versus qualitative user testing or doing something like A-B testing in addition to interviewing people. Having both of those things helps give more clarity to um, your understanding of, of what you need. And so when you're sitting down with somebody um, doing your one-to-one user research, how do, you, how do you make sure that you're getting the right information from them? How do, how do you make sure that they're comfortable to answer the questions honestly or, or be able to give you not necessarily the right feedback, but the, the feedback that's required to understand whether this, is, this product's being de- designed in the right direction? Mm-hmm. Well, I'd say even before, like when you're talking about how do I know I'm asking the right questions, um, Basically, what I always like to start out with before engaging in a user research session or, or segment or any kind of really research segment is outlining what we're trying to understand and what are the problems we're having issues with. I think being able to sit down and articulate this is the context of where we are, these are the questions we have and the problems we're facing, here are the questions I want to ask that'll help give me clarity or validate my assumptions, you know, some way that you can outline these are the assumptions or these are the questions, and these kind, knowing these, this information will help me um, or help the team succeed, right? To be able to sit down and do that, I think, helps validate why we're doing research and helps tie it back to a need. Sometimes we just jump into research and ask questions and find things out because some of us are curious of this or that, but then um, if we don't tie it back to an initial objective, uh, when you're communicating your learnings, there kind of could be, that. well, that's great, but how do I, <laughs> what do I do with this? Why did we do this? What makes sense? So by first establishing this is our research plan and these are the goals and this is what we hope to accomplish, that helps field your questions. Um, and then when we get into actually how do I make sure I'm not biased when I'm talking to a person, right? Because we all have biases when we bring um, into... Uh, just in life, right? We all have some kind of bias, but there's there's several things that give you coaching as far as not to put your opinion onto them in the way that you can um, pretty much start asking questions and then even having the technique of like trailing off and letting them complete the sentence, but not feeding them ideas, but just asking them questions about, well, what do you think is supposed to happen? Not tell them what's supposed to happen in the application if they have questions or you know, put it back on them and how do they feel about it. Um, there's, yeah, there's ways that you can ask questions that's not giving the user the answer or telling the user exactly what they, um, what you expect them to do, but trying to get them to talk without any kind of assumptions themselves. And is, and is it also sometimes asking the same thing in different ways to try and elicit yes. different responses and they might be able to unearth that, that mm-hmm. uh, unique kind of insights that you yeah. didn't could have gleaned if you asked it one way because it felt maybe leading it. In, in yeah, way. and you try to be objective as, as possible. And usually the, the person interviewing is not the designer or the person um, who has a bit huge stake in the prototype. So they may not even know what supposedly, quote unquote, is in the debate or what's the right, the right solution. Yeah, and that was going to be my question was, you, you know, how, how much is there a need to have an outside person doing the, the user research so, so that they're not biased or have a filter yeah. to, the, to the insights coming out of it, whether that's a third-party organization or somebody from within the, the, the organization building the product, but coming in to, to specifically do this so that they, they, they don't know what, what the bigger picture is of what's being built, but they're just trying to get the, the person to do the tasks or yeah. to, to get the insights. I think it's a nice to have, right? And it's definitely the ideal way to have the solution because they don't have some of those biases bringing into it and they can just objectively ask questions. They have no feelings about it. I mean, I think even of that Silicon Valley user research test where it's like the user research was going so badly in one of the seasons, but the the tester or moderator was just so flatlined because he didn't care one way or the other, right? That's that's helpful. Um, But 
we've had the need where we don't have a specific researcher and we want to find the information. And so we do have in some instances where the person designing it is also asking the questions, but um, they're able to filter out and make sure that they're not priming in su such a way, or we can also filter that into the data based on um, the recording. I've The only people that I find super challenging not to put their bias into it when they're asking questions is usually like the product owner. And not that they can't, right? Going in, if you're, you're set up to and you, you um, are conscious about it, but you typically I find that if the product owner is sitting in with a user researcher, they can't help but then ask the next like, well, what about this? And how about this? And do, you know, they don't stick to uh, a user script. So that's another way to help with your bias questioning if you're wondering about how it, it might go down as having a script that you're going to have in your user testing. And that'll help, you know, make sure you clarify in questions that aren't and leading. And consistency for each person yes. as well. You know you're asking the same 10, 12, mm -hmm. 15, whatever questions for everyone in the same manner. Correct. And sometimes in, in user testing, I'm trying to test a, cup, a variation of the same flow and so I might have flow A and flow B, and there's similarities to it, but I want them to rate it. So when I have something like that, I'll switch it up in every other user testing so that the response, people aren't always seeing option A first, because that could also change your opinion. I have some people who see option B first and filter in that, that information. But, I mean, bias and priming is a thing. <laughs> and I've even had great user researchers um, who I was even wondering if there was some kind of priming just because we were asking so many questions about a single task um, and a single thing that when we showed them the prototype, they were like, yeah, I just want to be able to have this one piece of information. I just want to focus on one user at a time. But when our group had talked to other users outside of this user research, they, they were talking about managing so many different people at a time that they were really talking about groups. And so it was odd to me that we were getting so much feedback about managing one person at a time versus managing groups. And I had some questions about, is it just, do you think the way we're asking a bunch of, like showing them and talking about one person at a time, that by the time we get to the prototype, it's a logical sense versus you know, what they're really doing in their, in their every day. And so then we changed up the, the, the structure to see how that, how that changed the prototype yeah, and that question. Yeah. So it, that's also why you can't do research once, <laughs> yeah. right? But it's not like you have to do everything all at once, mm -hmm. right? It's, it's we learn something, we can go on to the next, and then we're going to continually learn as we go. Yeah, and I think that's really important as you kind of zero in on, so as you focus on their user, you, you spend time understanding their behavior, talking to them to understand their needs and motivations, and then getting into their testing initial prototypes, and then start to act on that, and then test again and iterate. And so we, that's a very focused, you know, one-to-one, one-to-few approach. As we think of one-to-many uh, one type of research, the market research, understanding um, at a, a broader sense, the opportunity and the need. Um, how do you how do you zero in on what are the what are the key techniques, the key uh, approaches to to getting some value out of market research? So you're not spending so much time gathering mountains of data, mm -hmm. and then di di you know digging into that and, and trying to uncover a few gems. How do you how do you kind of stay focused on market research? So on market research, um, staying focused with them. Really what I'm interested in is identifying trends, and sometimes I utilize it to understand the context of the environment in which we're designing. So if I'm trying to zoom out even bigger picture, if I have, I have my user and I understand the user journey, but then I want to even zoom out and say this is the world and here are some of the things that affect people um, in a certain way, I'll use market research to really understand some of that, fill in some of that bigger picture about how environments and economies and trends impact people. And I mean, it's something even with the idea of, like take for example, understanding Bitcoin and how you have to use graphic cards to mine data. And so that also has an impact then on the price of graphic cards and the impact of how um, users you know, will be able to buy and, and have those kinds of trends and what's going on with them. Um, I use that as like bigger picture, interesting things that we can leverage and bring into our um, application that's on on um, point for where we see 
uh, technology going. Yeah, because you definitely want to look at current market trends as well as what is that next future trend because Mm -hmm. the product that you're building, the application that you're building, yes, it can be updated, modified, and iterated on, but you do want it to have longevity. Mm -hmm. You know, you don't want to have to rebuild something new every year because there's a new trend coming in or a new way that it's being used that you haven't tried to at least foresee in some way or or at least build for that change. And Russell, uh, who's been on a a number of previous episodes, talks about build for change, prepare for Mm -hmm. change. And part of that is just keeping an eye a little bit over your shoulder of what's coming yes. from a trend perspective as well as what's the current market as well. And so what are, what are, what are some of the ways and, or, or data points that you would look for um, to, to be able to understand the, the market trends? Um, for there, really to understand some of the market trends, I'd probably look at some more, instead of me doing some more research and understanding um, and conducting like trend research, I just try to leverage what's already out there. Yeah. So that's where I'm really leveraging and market research. I'm more leveraging what reports are already out there to understand um, what's going on as far as, I mean, even technical trends, right? Like the uh, fusion of using chat app, everybody's on chat applications. So how do we start, um, if we really want that as part of people's daily lives, how do I start leveraging chat applications and APIs to start, um, you know, being in somebody's daily life in that regard? Um, how can we leverage um, some of the service industry trends or how can we leverage the behaviors that people are, are using or the expectation of hyper-personalization and the way everybody wants to have that local feel? How do I... Um, basically tap into what people are expecting, liking, and trending towards. And so the third type of research to, to, to help with building successful products, and as you said, this kind of blurs a little bit or crosses over. There's mm-hmm. a Venn diagram somewhere, I'm sure, of user research and design research. Mm-hmm. So this third, the third leg of the stool, um, design research. So to dig into that, what, what, what does that entail and how does that evolve from the user research or the market research? So with that, it really, and maybe that's also blending those types of research into one big thing of design research because it's utilizing those techniques to really help inform our design solutions. And our design solution doesn't necessarily have to be a product, right? Designers are designing for experiences. It can be as something as instead of a mobile app, we're going to do an audible like Alexa extension because of the experience and the things that we're seeing. Um, this will really you know, help us uh, grow our market share if we have a product like like this to solve for a particular need. Like ordering pizza. Yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or I can do emoji chat, right? <laughs> like to order pizza. I can also do it audible through, uh, um, yeah, through an Alexa or Google Home and, and something like that. And so with design research, I see also a lot of methods to help get alignment for the product team, right? So it's a lot of it is not only diving in and understanding and getting information, but also how do we leverage the teams and the people that we have now and what are the activities and workshops that we can do to get information from them that's helpful and productive, right? Because there's some meetings where if I just sit down and start interviewing my stakeholders, they may have so much experience and get caught off on such tangents that they'll give me a lot of information, but it's not the information I exactly can utilize to actually build a product or it's so in the weeds that I'm having a hard time actually designing the big picture and understanding how it fits. So design research to me has a lot of techniques to help organize and like almost what I'd say herd the cats and being able to get the information I need that actually helps me build a product from either stakeholders or users or um, being able to leverage different trends to really get that information. And that might be anywhere from, once again, ethnographic research and just observing people to um, running a workshop and um, getting feedback to A-B testing as well. And so those three types, that some, some feel like they, they, they run a little bit in, whether that's parallel or, or definitely tight sequential. Um, what sort of time period are you thinking about when you're, let's say you're trying to build a new application, a new product, maybe it is a new mobile application or and I know it's obviously dependent on the features and a number of other different requirements, but 
how much time would you expect people to spend on each of these different types of research? Is it months, weeks, days? Is there any kind of guidance you can give our listeners so that they know, okay, I'm spending too much time or yes. maybe I should spend a little bit more time? So it can be as, as short within a week. Um, Getting all three? Yeah, uh, potentially. At least to get to the, like, if I'm really saying we have this hard, like, problem and we want to solve it, let's knock it out in a week. Now, and that's outlined, I think, what I would use is like a Google design sprint to knock it out in a week. But that's an intense, everybody's using a lot of time. It's not just one person utilizing their week to get it done, right? So that's a big, it's it's a a team team group effort, and it's everybody's time for a week, right? And so that's, that can be... It's fast, and it's also costly if we want to be in other meetings and have other things we want to do, but it's efficient, and um, you can knock something out quickly. Now, and when you, you knock that out, it's not big picture, kind of. We know that there's a problem in the automotive space, and we want to solve it. Like, you're not going to figure out your solution necessarily in a week. You can come up with good ideas and do a good workshop and have some possibilities, um, but what I'm talking about in a week is more... Do we want to build an app this way or that way? Um, and there's several stories, I think, in the, that book that, that outlines how you can tackle ideas in a week where it might be, do we want our homepage in this version or this version? Do we know people will sign up better in this way or that way? And you f- identify that area um, that you want to solve for and knock it out in a week. Um, usually a couple weeks is good to understand and get that information, and I think that's also the most relevant, right? Because usually after a couple weeks, whatever problems we're solving, if we haven't resolved them, we've moved on to the next thing. And we may have just said that's an assumption and move on, or we may be able to actually um, validate some ideas. So that's where within a couple weeks you can find um, is a good spot just to set up the research plan, get the meetings on the schedule, and synthesize that information and be able to utilize it and start uh, adapting it within your process. And so if you're taking, taking these, these three pillars from user, market, and design research, and you are digging into that problem, that need, that, that new solution that you want to build, and, and you just mentioned that there's some things you're going to be able to say, yes, this is the direction, and there's some way you're going to have to need to make an assumption. Mm-hmm. And if the research that you find, you're making that informed direction of let's move in this direction and mm-hmm. continue to test. That's a data point to continue to assess. Yes. And I think that's important that you don't get stuck. Yes. <laughs> and it's important. It's so important for the whole team, for like for morale, to feel like we're making progress and moving forward. Um, I've been a part of projects where it seems like it feels like we're moving forward. And then we've got to open up the can of worms again to say, you know, we haven't thought about this edge case or that edge case or this small thing. And so it feels like we're not, we're stuck, right? We're constantly iterating on the same thing for several weeks, right? It's not just a couple weeks, let's iterate and we're fine. But it's like, I remember talking with a team and they were saying that this could potentially take, you know, eight weeks to design this particular checkout flow. And I just thought my mind was blown where, like we have conventions for this and we can use and we've user test that in a couple weeks like why is it taking so much time just for this one little area right because it's it's, there's only so much time you can spend and understand so much from your users in a testing environment and research phase versus let's get it out there and have much more people using it and get, and have a plan to iterate and A-B test and so on from that. Well, and it's also the value is diminished, right? If we're iterating on something for eight weeks that has maybe some kind of convention or um, maybe it's trying to account for too much and it isn't specific and nobody knows what this is really for, um, it's just the value of it just... T- tapers off, which is also why when we're talking about doing some more time intensive interviews and ethnographic research, um, five people is a great number to have because after that, the value of you doing it over and over again and the patterns you're seeing is diminishing. So then you're spending more time getting less information or learning new things. And so that's the, that's the thing we're weighing here too when being pragmatic is I'd have only so much time and so much capacity to understand stuff, right? We're not an infinite, we like to think we're infinitely, you know, resourceful, but we only have so much information we can store in a day, so much energy, so much attention span. And um, so we've got to utilize that 
efficiently and smartly so that we can move forward. So let's dig into the, the, the pragmatic. We've, we've talked about being really focused in those three key areas of research, but taking a pragmatic approach so that you do keep moving forward and you do keep um, this product moving into production and develop, into ent- development and, pr- mm-hmm. and pr- finally into production so that it, it can make a business impact um, or a user impact and, and continue to differentiate your organization. So what, what, do you, what, do you, what do you feel like you mean when you say pragmatic? What does pr- pragmatic mean to you? So it's similar to kind of what I was alluding to before, where it's enough information that we can find in this short period of time for us to move forward and help us build a product and be informed and be nimble. And I find that we have um, different questions or different toolkits that we're using within each one of those different types, depending on the phase of which we are in, in building, say, a new solution or even an existing solution, right? We first have to make sure that we understand and have some good uh, validation to our assumptions that this is desirable, right? So then I'm asking more questions about high level about the value and that people want this and confirming that there's some desirability to our solution and to our ideas. Then I may want to get into something about this is different, right? This is different than other solutions that other people have encountered. They understand that there's um, something unique that they can get here with us that they couldn't get with somewhere else and um, that we are, you know, stand out from our competitors, not just a, a replica. And then once we have that, then we've really established a good value to our customers that people will pay for it or, or want it. And then we have to make sure it's feasible within our organization. So testing out what's actually, um, can we actually build, right? And this right? is where the engineer coming in, the yes. builders need to be part of this process as much as possible. Yes, because we may have come up with a great desirable solution, but guess what? It's going to be really expensive and we can't build it or it doesn't, you know, that thing doesn't exist. And so we have to tweak it. So then we want to make sure it's feasible not only engineering, but maybe also for our organization that it fits for who we are. Um, And then uh, the viable stage that we can get it out, this is where um, it can stand on its own two legs and then we can start refining the performance. So the viable might be more about the tweaking the business model, making sure it can, you know, have its own uh, standing and exist and that it can support itself and then the performance will be tweaking and iterating and refining that. And so um, we go from ways of that's a lot more maybe trends, maybe fluffier, maybe a few qualitative people into more these are it's really crucial we have numbers and that this is supported and we're looking at the 80% and we're going from really rough prototypes and conversations to getting more and more realistic into um, prototypes and pilots and, you know, releasing it in multiple cities and, and iterating it on that. So what, what kind of, what, for listeners who want to take this approach and, and really start to kind of fine-tune their, their approach to research, what, what, what are the, some of the do's and don'ts that you, you, you suggest that they take on board so that they can be very focused from moving from big picture to granular? Yeah, so I find when... Um, we engage with uh, clients and new new folks on a project, it really is helpful for us to start off with some of those um, interviews, whether it's ethnography and watching people, whether it's contextual interviews and talking to people. Um, that really helps us paint that big picture and have a shared understanding of, of what's going on. Um, I've had, I've kicked off projects where they've had a bunch of documentation and said, here, Sarah, and just this documentation, but the way to interpret all that information and get to where they were, it was still hard for us to get on the same page. So really by sharing through stories and conversations and through workshops, that's really helpful to get a real understanding of what's going on. There's difference, there's a difference between you hearing that this is a pain point and then you watching somebody having to, to do that or you living through it yourself. There's that part of it's the way we learn. It's very human about us through storytelling and through empathy that we can really grasp and solve for the problem a little, a little better. Um, when I talk about thinking of things to avoid based on personal experience, um, I've had the problem where we've gotten 
too broad, right? So we might want to do research about, when I think about this, we were wanting to understand our users. And our users were internal employees, and internal employees were, there's just so many people, and there were so many um, things, parts that, were, that we could understand who were eventually going to use this product, that by not narrowing it down to something practical that we were going to utilize right out of the gate, we started it just... It, it just seemed like, what's the point of any of this, right? We started outlining certain things, and we started um, understanding certain users, but it seemed like it wasn't really geared towards how we could practically use this for different applications and projects. It was good information. It was interesting information, but without with being too broad and not honing in on how we were first going to utilize that, it ended up being something that was hard for people to grasp and, and, and utilize. At the flip side, I've also started projects where people got too granular <laughs> in, the app, in, in looking in the weeds and really trying to solve for understanding this one specific use case that only happens you know, every so often versus looking at the big picture of the experience and saying this, these are the important pain points rather than honing in on solving for one pain point that was um, lost in the big picture. Um, I've also worked with, uh, if we can avoid analysis paralysis, where we want to make sure we understand every edge case or every um, more information before we uh, end up making a decision, then we come into a place where we lose the vision, we don't have you know, a purpose for this application, and we end up getting really stalled in the analysis paralysis um, part. And then um, some do things that I would recommend is, um, you know, use your research to really solve questions that the team is wrestling with, right? Rather than trying to solve for everything or anything you can think of, really in conversations, you can pick up what people are struggling with and what they want to find answers to. And we can do um, a research plan to be able to answer those questions and do it in a short term so that we can go to the next uh, uh, stage. Um, we really want to see if we can spend time validating our assumptions, if we can outline these are the things we think, you know, we assume that is correct and right, and we don't have any information that ties it to it. It's really helpful to being able to validate it. I know there's a time where we did user research to validate what we thought was the MVP, and it turns out some of our assumptions were a little off, and we were able to include new features or new um, things that really would add value to our users and to our customers. So validating your assumptions is, is super helpful because even if you think you know everything about people and their users, it's helpful to just make sure and, and do that gut check. Um, sometimes with the validating assumptions, you find out, yes, you're right and move on, but then sometimes you're able to adjust the MVP. And we've, we've done both. And then I mentioned, yeah, creating that research plan is super helpful um, and interviewing five people and um, I find utilizing tools, if you're a designer, I love Envision. You can use also that user testing enterprise version. We've also used uh, tools like Usability Hub to get several people um, looking at our application and testing it. And um, I've been paired with uh, people who use Mixpanel or other things that help them do A-B testing to get some of those, those stats. So, um, yeah, that's some of no, my that's, do's that's, and don'ts. Yeah, that's definitely some uh -huh. great direction. You know, getting that structure in place, um, keeping, your, keeping your, um, your viewpoint broad enough to, to look at everything, uh, but not too broad to try and capture everything, to solve for everything. And I think that's, that comes from experience as mm -hmm. well. And so it is looking at uh, you as an individual trying to do this research, you know, if you need to reach out to a third party to understand how to structure, to stay focused, but look big enough, um, you know, what, what are the best guidance on that? That's, that's really important as well. So I always like to kind of capture some final pieces of, of advice and resources that you'd recommend for our listeners. So, so within an, if, 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 if you're, if somebody's listening and they're in an enterprise organization and they're trying to start a product, um, or start the process around a product and they're wanting to dig into doing some research, what advice would you give them, um, to, to, to be successful in their role? Yeah, so there are definitely folks who, like Steve Jobs and Malcolm Gladwell, who do have this advice about following your gut and your intuition. And I do believe that um, product development and bringing about innovation and change 
There's some aspects of being able to follow your intuition and bringing about a vision of future that not everything everybody says is authentic and true and that there's a vision you have to bring and be able to communicate to bring about change. Um, yeah, Steve Jobs, I know a lot of times followed his gut and what was a good product development and um, what made a good product. Now, he also failed a lot, which we don't always talk about until he finally revi was refined and being able to bring about successful products. And then um, in Malcolm Gladwell, one of his books, he talks about intuition and how um, people can just know if things are a fake or if it's real or if things are going to happen based on their intuition. And if you start having them try to explain their intuition, it starts kind of breaking down the process. The process of explaining and being analytical sort of breaks down that gut feeling. But you can't get that gut feeling without doing a lot of immersion in research and understanding and really knowing your audience and the environment and space in which they're in. And so to get to a good gut and intuition, you have to do these kinds of activities of learning and immersing yourself in this world so that you can be able to begin to strategize and manipulate the information and really start following that gut. You don't just build it from just You've having got to take a, a big personality. Yes, exactly. <laughs> you can't be the loudest person, the hippo, the highest paid person's opinion mm -hmm. in the room. You've got to... It's got to be based on something, and, and to get to that p position, to get to that situation where you can say, this is the direction we need to, to go because that's how I feel it needs to be, you've got to get that experience in place, and pragmatic research is a way to get there. Mm -hmm. So if people were looking for further reading or further resources, um, any recommendations? I know you've mentioned a couple of tools already. Um, yes. Anything else that you'd add? So there's two books that I may even have mentioned in my previous talks, but I'm big on them. One is that... Um, sprint book, How to Solve Big Problems and Test New Ideas in Five Days. The reason I love it is it has a lot of stories in it so that you can understand the value of doing research quickly, but it also has a great outline, whether you can, you know, you want to follow it for your five days or you want to see these are the kinds of things I need to address over my research period. It's a great guideline. Um, and then the Value Proposition Canvas by Strategizer, that also is a great tool to utilize and understand how do I test that, what we're talking about, those high-level assumptions down to a granular assumption. And it has different toolkits and ways in which it kind of breaks down, here's how we're adding value, here's how we can articulate value, here's how we can test the, the value we think we are articulating, and um, here's different workshops, outlines that we can utilize. So it's very practical in ways that you can, you can follow along and mold it to what you need it to be. That's great. And we'll include links to all of these resources and all the other ones that you've mentioned through this episode uh, in our show notes at dialexa.com. And so, Sarah, thanks again for joining us this week. This has been a really interesting conversation around research and how to take a pragmatic approach to it. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 